Joining me today is the Vice President of Policy with the Michigan Energy Innovation Business Council, Corey Connolly. Corey is a tremendous advocate for clean energy within the state of Michigan and has devoted countless hours of his life to renewable energy. Corey is a graduate of Michigan State University, just like me, with an extensive background in clean energy where he has been in positions such as an energy consultant with Five Lakes Energy, a senior research associate at the Environmental Law Institute, and even the COO at Levin Energy Partners. Corey and I have only known each other for a few months as he is the director of the Michigan Clean Energy Leaders Project, a group that he was kind enough to select me to be a part of this year. Corey, thanks for joining me on the Solar Spotlight. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to have you, man. Well, while we've got everyone's attention, can you, can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and at what point did you decide to devote your life to what you're doing with renewable energy and the environment and policy change? Yeah, so I'm, I'm originally from Northport, Michigan, which folks, if you could see me put my hand up, it's the tip of the Leelanau Peninsula, so right at the tip of the pinky up there. It's a town of about 600 folks in the wintertime, more in the summer. And, and so I grew up there. I ended up going to, going to Michigan State, and I was studying international relations. I thought I wanted to go, um, go somewhere abroad, do international development work, et cetera. And then during school, I got l- linked up with this group called the Roosevelt Institute, and they were, which is a self-fashioned sort of student think tank uh, across the country, and we were working in at the local chapter on wind and solar and net metering policy and feed-in tariffs and everything. And I got totally fascinated by it, working on it, it, it when I was a student in my extra time that I added uh, energy and environmental economics as a specialization before graduating, strictly because I had enjoyed working on it outside of class so much. And that was sort of the, sort of the transition point for me. Um, and it was largely driven by... Uh, looking at the the massive transformation that is underway and was already underway. I mean, this was 2007. I was already, you know, it was already an exciting space to be in then. And now we're already seeing, we're seeing a much different and a different scale of transformation happening now. So um, I was really drawn to it for that and for environmental reasons. Personally, I'm, I'm pretty big environmentalist and care about climate change, but I was also just drawn into it because I think it's a, it, it's really interesting to be in a space that's transforming um, so rapidly. So that's, that's kind of how I got into it. And my career trajectory was sort of, I decided to still pursue some of that international work. I spent a little bit of time in Detroit doing um, some environmental justice related work and a little bit of consulting, like you said, with Five Lakes Energy. And then I went to DC and mostly worked in climate and energy policy, uh, working in Mexico predominantly and relocated to Mexico for a little bit to work on that with some local governments there and then decided to move back to Michigan, move back to Detroit. Um, and uh, I actually spent a, a very short contract consulting for Green Lancer uh, back in 2014 as I was in between gigs working with Pat. Um, and then I, uh, I ended up uh, linking up with... Um, Levin Energy Partners and Lean and Green Michigan PACE program got really into clean energy finance, sort of identifying that um, that this big transformation is happening, but the only way it can happen is if we mobilize large amounts of money and capital uh, to get that done as fast as we need it to get done. And so I, I got into that finance world and then I sort of all full circle uh, two years ago, decided to come back into the policy world and joined up with the Michigan Energy Innovation Business Council um, where now I do legislative policy uh, and dabble in, in some other regulatory world policy and such as well. But in our organization is a, is a trade association. It's a 501c6 trade association of about 115, 120 members. And it's defined broadly as advanced energy. So it's, we have a handful of residential solar installers, uh, utility scale solar installers, utility scale wind, energy efficiency contractors, uh, energy storage developers, electric vehicle charging infrastructure providers, electric vehicle battery manufacturers, manufacturers of solar panels, manufacturers of wind turbines and the towers. So, and, and kind of everything in between. Um, and uh, 
it's sort of built on the idea that the industry is growing, but we're stronger together um, as we move toward this, you know, diverse mix of energy resources moving forward. So yes, yeah, so that's sort of sort of me how I got into into this space. And then I guess the one thing I didn't touch on that's worth flagging is you know the the Michigan Clean Energy Leaders Project, which which Nick you're a part of now. Uh, I decided to to start that a couple years ago. I got a grant from One Hotels and the Natural Resource Defense Council and Environmental Entrepreneurs, a, an organization that works on this space nationally, and to to host a couple of retreats. Uh, with a cohort of young clean energy leaders from across Michigan built on the concept of building strong lasting relationships for folks that wanted to work in this industry for decades to come doing it through, uh, you know, these personal weekend long retreats and uh, trying to build those relationships. So that these folks, when they see each other in rooms or uh, have questions when they're trying to deploy more renewables or deal with, um, any type of in issue in this industry that they have a trusted source that they could call and ask a question or find a way to get it, get a project done or something like that. So, um, so we, so we did that in 2018 and then in 2020 um, we launched the second iteration of it, um, which Nick is a part of, which you're a part of Nick and, and uh, pretty grateful to have your participation. And it's a pretty fun, fun group of folks. I wish we could get in per get together in person though. Yeah, and I do too. And if I could also say thank you again for having me be a part of it. I've absolutely loved it so far. It is unfortunate that we can't all get together in beautiful northern Michigan, but I'm still learning a lot. I truly believe that perspective is everything. And hearing perspective on so many different topics that I would not have had I not had this opportunity that you presented me with, you know, I don't know where I would be necessarily when I think of things from other people's scenarios. So it's definitely awesome. Like I said, I couldn't be more excited to be a part of it. I wanted to touch real quick too on Northern Michigan, because in the very beginning there, you said that you were an environmentalist. And you know, for people that live in Michigan, most of us have visited the Northwest part of the state where you grew up. For those around the country that listen to this podcast, because Green Lancer works in all 50 states, I don't think people know just how beautiful Northwest Michigan is and that some of the beaches would rival that of a tropical vacation. I always tell people with how blue the water is and just how breathtakingly beautiful everything is up there. So did growing up there, do you think that had any effect on uh, you caring so much for the environment and wanting to keep things the way they are in your hometown? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I grew up on Lake Michigan. My folks bought up their school teacher and a and a, a couple of school teachers they they bought property up there back when it was really cheap and moved up there 40 40 ish years ago and yeah certainly being by the big lakes and you know the beautiful beaches and the sand dunes and everything uh, certainly had had an impact and i also think interestingly i got exposed to some folks up there uh in Michigan might be a familiar name with some people, but I don't know about other places, but this guy, Steve Smiley, who's a, a family friend from growing up, he was kind of the first person that introduced me to solar and renewables. And he had like a, at the time in 2006, 2007, he had like a 98% off grid house or something in the woods in Northern Michigan, which, it, you know, interestingly, even though that's not necessarily just because of the environment up there, it's also, you know, there are a lot more folks who are trying to do that kind of thing and maybe have the ability to. Um, and so I got to kind of see how that worked firsthand um, and how his lifestyle worked. And I, and I realized it, it was pretty easy to see that, that these technologies worked at that point. So. Oh, that's awesome. So you are a busy man. You clearly do a lot of different things and you've done a lot of different things for a very long time. You touched a little bit on how you've actually gone international. So I know you've seen, a lot of different perspectives. I'm sure you th see people doing things from what you think is the wrong way to the right way. But right now, you're looking to, to make some changes here in our, our home state of Michigan. Where exactly do you think Michigan could use some improvements when it comes to transitioning to renewable energy? Yeah, so I mean, the answer is I think there's a lot that can be done. 
and it's going to be a little bit less specific than maybe would be gratifying. But I think the reality is that the renewable energy transition is massive. Like the transition that's on a transition that's underway, moving to wind and solar to battery storage, et cetera. It's not just swapping in different generation sources. It's also changing exactly what the geography of the grid looks like and what technologies are on it and whether you can generate power at your home and whether you can generate power in your community that's clean and doesn't pollute your local community, et cetera. Right. And coming with that comes opportunities for different types of ownership, a lot more opportunities for homeowners to own their own power, a lot more opportunities for communities to have more input and and contribute to that. And so I think that maybe the biggest obstacle or or where we're, we're lacking is just that it's tough to move big systems, both that are literal physical infrastructure that needs to be transitioned, but also institutions where you see how we've done it for a long time needs to change, but it's hard to figure out how to, how to get there. And a lot of it's not because anyone doesn't want it to change. It's just sort of, that's the way things have been set up. So uh, I think that as a broad, as a broad point is probably where we're maybe the, I, I sort of married a couple of questions here, but probably where the biggest obstacle is to me is just sort of that institutional and physical inertia that comes with the way we've done things for, for generations. Mm -hmm. Um, And in terms of, you know, where, you know, where the state is lacking. I mean, I think, um, I think there are a lot of opportunities to, to better attract and create an environment where entrepreneurial companies in this space can thrive. And I'd like to see that, you know, I think I've talked to you a bit about this. There there are some policies here in Michigan that really do limit the ability for uh, rooftop solar installers to come to the state. And I, I, that's one of the things that I fight on all, all the time, every day. And um, one that we're running into right now is a a 1% cap on solar in different investor and utility jurisdictions. It's 2% in the upper peninsula in UPCO's territory, but in other territories, it's capped at 1% participation in the distributed generation program, which is akin, though different, but akin to like a net metering program or something like that for folks that are in other markets. Basically, subscription to that program is capped at 1%. That means that in a number of jurisdictions, we're about to hit that 1%. And it's unclear exactly what the landscape looks like and what the what the program looks like after that for rooftop solar installers that want to be doing this work and have built livelihoods around it. So that's, that's one of the things that I think is lacking is kind of creating the opportunity for, um, you know, entrepreneurs and, and for um, some of this market competition when it comes to rooftop solar installing is one that I've been focused on a lot lately. And um, I think is, is a gap. So. I couldn't agree more. And one of the things that I think too, when I tell people about this is I think it's a combination of lack of exposure and with that lack of exposure, lack of education. I feel like there's, there's still not a whole lot of solar in Michigan as there is opposed to other states like Massachusetts and California. And with that lack of exposure, people don't really know a whole lot about it and they don't realize how beneficial it could be to their lives and to everyone else's lives, benefits to the economy, et cetera. So I I appreciate everything you just said there. I'm going to kind of ask you a question that wasn't necessarily on the questionnaire here, but it just got me thinking, what can people do, do you think, to get more involved to see these types of changes take place here in Michigan? Well, I I think that the real simple, easy thing is, reach out to all your elected officials all the way up and down, you know, so particularly state legislators and state representatives and state senators hearing from their constituents that they're interested in policies that support solar goes a long way. And then similarly in your local communities, if there are opportunities for local ordinances to, to be improved, et cetera, just knowing that constituents care, it really does matter. Like, particularly with local elected officials, the 
hearing from a constituent on on something, let alone hearing from five or six or seven or whatever, they they will start to take notice uh, because it's their job, right? So that's one thing that I think is really important um, that folks can do. Another thing that this isn't quite what people can do, but it it ties to what you were talking about. I I had a group of friends in Detroit where we we tried for a little while to to have a project called Solar Party Detroit, where we would actually solar power DJ sets and uh, and and we did a solar powered Mario Kart at an Open Streets event oh. and stuff. Just sort of like solar powering fun things to get people yeah. exposed to it, based on that same theory that you're talking about. Um, so I mean, I'm not quite sure what people what what folks could do. Uh, we we haven't done that for a little while, but I do think that that is a gap in terms of helping folks get exposed to it and understand it. I, I do think that if folks are interested in doing solar, it's a great time to sign up for it, right? <laughs> and and that'll help expose it to, to other people in your community. And there is actually a demonstrable effect uh, that folks can refer to as solar contagion, where actually by seeing solar go up in a community, it's much more likely to um, exponentially grow in adoption in that area as you have more and more add on. So yeah. um, for okay. folks who are in that position, that early mover could be really influential. So, Absolutely. I've seen that happen personally in my career time and time again. And it's, it's so funny how every time I put solar up, people have questions. Neighbors are coming outside and looking They'll come over to the truck and be asking the crew, you know, certain questions or how much, how much does it cost? And it's, it's fun because you get that opportunity to educate them because now they're exposed to it for the first time, like I said. So couldn't agree with you more, man. You've been doing this for a little while now. You've seen things change. What was the biggest win that you've seen in your career so far for the state of Michigan when it comes to renewable energy in general? Boy, that's, t I mean, it's tough. I think, um, you know, it's interesting uh, on a lot of these issues only by virtue of the fact that, you know, we live in the time that we live, everything, it, a lot of the stuff that's happening is the most aggressive, the biggest commitment, whatever that we've seen in terms of renewables. So seeing um, the investor owned utilities publicly making commitments around renewables and, and carbon free electricity by 2040, I think, in consumers' territory and 2050 in DTE's territory, that's a pretty big thing, right? That's different than what we've seen in the past. Um, I think that, you know, some of the other mechanisms or, or bills that are passed, you know, Michigan sort of goes through a cadence of every eight years or so. There's an energy rewrite, and a lot of what happened in the 2016 legislation was really important for, for driving the industry forward. I'd say that the 2008, in, you know, legislation was probably even more foundational because it was really kind of getting things going. But I think I'll, I'll come back to a couple of things that just for me personally, of things that I've been involved in that I can think of as a, as a win, you know, the, the Lean and Green Michigan Pace program um, where I worked uh, for a stretch and, and drove all over the state getting people to sign up for jurisdictions, that program, it, you know, Unlocking some financing tools between that and things like Michigan Saves, I think those are some wins that we'll keep on giving over time that I think are really valuable to look at that aren't maybe the typical policy wins that we think about, but that do make it easier to deploy renewables faster. So I don't know if I have one specific thing, but I think I touched on a few things that I think are I can be optimistic about and that I think were are, were or are wins for um, what we're working toward. Well, change doesn't come overnight and it's one win at a time, right? And right now we're, we're pioneers. You're a true pioneer, but what we're doing, it is important. And I personally appreciate everything you've done so far and appreciate everything that you continue to do and how you've brought me in to, to help with some of it. And I'm looking forward to learning more from you. And if there's anything I can continue to do to help, please just let me know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm appreciative of being able to be on this, on this, uh, on this podcast here and getting to get a peek into the solar world. Cause I think, I think your typical 
folks are more um, true solar industry folks as opposed to me who I'm sort of broadly advanced renewable energy uh, with with a lot of work going on on solar. So I'm appreciative and, and thank you. Awesome. Hey, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, what would you recommend is the best way? Email, phone, LinkedIn? What do you prefer? Uh, email and a recognition that I'm a little slow on it these days, but I'd go with, and I'd go with my personal just because you never know what thing somebody wants to talk about and that's the easiest space place to start. But it's just simply my personal email, my first name, C-O-R-Y dot Connolly, which is my last name, C-O-N-N-O-L-L-Y at gmail.com. So. Awesome. Corey, thank you so much for being my guest today. Look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, thank you. Take care.